not kicking on, and I don't know why. Pastor Tom, can you come check out that heat? It's supposed to be on and the air conditioner is not going on. Oh, there we go. Is it on? Cool. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. It was up to 75 in here and I said, this is a little warm. For some reason, it doesn't stay. We're going to have to get that fixed. I'll get another thermostat. Well, anyway, we want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you this morning up there in Maine. We want to say welcome to you. We also want to say welcome to Sajeev up in India, who's watching us live. That's amazing. A few years ago, that would not be possible. I want to say happy Father's Day, and I want you to see my message this morning. And the message, my, uh, the message this morning I have for you is, God, our Father, you know, he, is, he sticks closer than a brother. And I know that many of us, our fathers and our mothers, have gone on. They've passed away. But the Bible says that when, you can turn this mic down a little bit, please, because I get that, back, that kick back. The Bible says that when your father and mother forsake you, then the Lord will take you up. That word forsake in Hebrew doesn't mean leave you off. It means that he will come and he will gather you together. The Lord will lift you up. When your father and mother have left, he says, I'll lift you up. Amen? So our father, what is the responsibility of a father? Well, the goal of a father's involvement is to nurture his child's intellectual, emotional, physical and social and spiritual development. It's all inclusive. So when you talk of your heavenly father, he is there to meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Come on, somebody. He says he's here to help you with your intellectual, emotional, physical, social, and spiritual development. And that's what God does with us. And that's what our earthly fathers should do for us. Unfortunately, that's not in every case. The key is to focus on the child's strengths, utilizing the natural assets of a father's parenting style. Teaching through play, or teaching through play, is what draws your children to you. How many like a father that makes you giggle, makes you laugh, is always right there with you, but is stern enough to correct you and instruct you when he needs to. I want to give you some statistics this morning before we get into the word. On the research that shows when a child grows up in a father absent home, these things take place. Number one, four times more likely to live in poverty. That is according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Children in an absent home, uh, children in a father absent home, are almost four times more likely to be poor in the U.S. Number two, most more likely to suffer emotional and behavioral problems. Children of single mothers show higher levels of aggressive behavior than children born to married mothers. That's according to the Journal of Marriage and Family. Number three, they are two times greater risk of infant mort mortality. And infant mortality rates are nearly two times higher for infants of unmarried mothers than for married mothers, and that's according to the National Center for Health Statistics. And I'm giving you these for a reason. Number four, children who grow up in father-absent homes are more likely to commit crime. I'm sorry, more likely to go to prison. Listen to this. One in five prison inmates had a father in prison. That's according to the Department of Justice and the Office of Justice Programs. They are more likely to commit crime. A study of juvenile offenders indicated that 
the family structure significantly predicts delinquency. That's according to the Journal of Youth and Adolescence. Six, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen. Wow. Teens without fathers are twice as likely to be involved in early sexual activity and seven times more likely to get pregnant as an, as an adolescent. That's according to the Child Development Journal. A father absent home is more likely to face abuse and neglect. Compared to the children living with married biological parents, those who uh, those whose single parent had a live-in partner had more than eight times the rate of maltreatment overall, over ten times the rate of abuse, and more than six times the rate of neglect, according to the Child's Bureau. Number eight, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. Youth are more at risk of first substance use without a highly involved father, according to the social science research. Adolescents whose fathers were drug abusers revealed that parental smoking and drug use led to strained father-child relationships. This weakened relationships led to greater adolescence um, maladjustments with family and friends and a higher risk of adolescent drug use and smoking. Fathers who smoked cigarettes were less likely to enforce anti-smoking rules for their children and had weaker bonds in terms of adolescent admiration and emulation. That's according to pediatrics. Now that's just one area, but think of all the other areas. If a parent does drugs, it's hard for a parent to tell a child not to do drugs. If a parent doesn't take responsibility in driving and, and obeying the laws, and yet tells his son to not obey the laws, guess what? The son is most likely not to obey the laws. Two times more likely to suffer obesity. Obese children are more likely to live in father absent homes than the non-obese children. National Longitudinal Survey of the Youth. Children, obese children are more likely to live in father absent homes than non, uh, uh, that are non-obese children. Two times more likely to drop out of high school and it's the final one. Students living in a father absent homes are twice as likely to repeat a grade in school, according to the U.S. Department of Education. Father involvement in schools is associated with the higher likelihood of the children getting mostly A's, that's according to the U.S. Department of Education. In the typical elementary school classroom of 20 students, seven of them, over 33%, are growing up without biological fathers in the home, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Now, those of you who work with children, you know what I'm talking about. You see it every day. You see our homes, you see how uh, society is changing from the God-ordained family to a man-ordained family. And because of that, this country is suffering in the homes. Now, the Bible says that which is natural than that which is spiritual. So when we see these things in the natural, when you come to Christ, a lot of you that come to Christ, and you've had bad relationships with your father, it can reflect on you of how you have a relationship with your heavenly father. Because sometimes in the back of our minds, in our subconscious, we think that God is somewhat like our earthly father. But I want you to know that God's word says that our ways, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts, higher than our thoughts. And our Heavenly Father will never, ever do the things that some of us have gone through with our earthly fathers. Some of us have been abused. Some of us have been neglected. Some of us have been abandoned. But I want you to know that God will never, ever do that to any of you. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But when God is your father, he is the best father you'll ever have. He will never leave you 
or abandon you. Our earthly fathers do. Some of them on purpose. Some of them pass away. But most of all, when our fathers do leave us, we must not let that hurt, that emotional pain, tarnish our thinking of our Heavenly Father. In fact, our Father will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And isn't that just like an earthly father? Now, one thing that God does not do that earthly fathers do at times is spoil their children. Hallelujah. I'm not getting any amens. It's very quiet in here. You know? I mean, we all, we all like to get spoiled. But, you know, God doesn't spoil us because when we get spoiled, then we become entitled. We think that we deserve those things. And when an when a earthly father gives everything to his child, no matter what he wants, whether it's $200 sneakers or designer clothes or whatever it is, or, or a new car, whatever it is, when they do that, then the child, when he gets older, that doesn't know the ethics of work and, you know, putting sweat and, and hard work to obtain these things, they think they're entitled. If you doubt that, look at the millennial group that's out there now. <laughs> I mean, if you were to just bring a correction to them, all of a sudden they get this headache. Oh, they got to take pills. They got to they got to go and take a a, a rest day. They got to go take a, a, a sick day somewhere. They got to take a time out. They can't deal with reality, and. And some of these 18-year-olds and some of these uh, students in school and colleges, when, and I'm not trying to bring politics into this, but when Dave, uh, Donald Trump won the election, many of them had to cancel schools and cancel their tests. The teachers canceled their tests because they were too emotionally distraught. Yet when I read about in the 1940s, young men of 18 years old storming the beaches of Normandy. Yes, with a little bit of fear in their hearts, but they still went. Because they had something that the young people today don't have. They had ethics. They had some moral conviction in their hearts. And even today, those that join the, the, uh, the, um, the armed forces... They go with a conviction in their heart. Hallelujah. God doesn't spoil us, but he does meet our needs. Amen? So here are three things, and I'm sure there's many others, but here's the three things that I've chosen this morning that God will do for us and for you as your father. Number one, he will provide for you. Isn't it nice when your father provides for you? Now, I remember growing up as a kid, and Joe can verify this, because Joe and I have been friends for over 45 years. Okay. And uh, I grew up in the west end of New Bedford. Uh, back in the 70s, when, uh, early 70s, 69, 70, when the riots took place, I was one of the few white people to live in the west end. And I'll tell you, we had uh, no problems at all integrating, because you know why? Because I'm not, you can't find a prejudiced bone in my body. And I remember as we grew up, and even with Joe and his mom and dad, and his dad worked hard at Revere Copper and Brass, and my dad worked as a bartender many years. And, but we always had food on the table. No matter what, we always had some. And we may not have liked it that much. But my mom would always sneak me something if my father was eating liver. Uh, what's that, that blood, blood pudding? Musella, they call it. Ugh. Can't even, can't even look at it today. My mother would give me hot dogs instead. But we always had enough because our fathers went and they worked and they brought money in and 
they made sure that they provided for us. And there was times I'd go over to Joe's house to eat, and, and uh, his mother would make jag, and, and uh, we would eat and chicken, and, and uh, I don't know if we had steak or roast or whatever we used to have at your house, I forget. But we used to eat good at his house. And then you come over to my house, and my mother would make these recipes, and I still remember them. I can almost taste them, how good they were. You know, remember that cream of chicken over the mashed potatoes? Yeah, huh? Oh, oh yeah, all good stuff. There was always something provided for us. I don't think there's been a day, and you have to understand, when I grew up, I grew up in the projects. When I, when I was real little, little, we lived in the Nashmont projects on Nash Road. We didn't have it easy. And my mom would tell me stories of my dad when he would, my, he was a roofer, he was a roofer but, but for a very short time. Because for some reason, I guess he was clumsy. And uh, he was, uh, in fact, uh, if, you, if you go on Route 18, you see that, uh, that white church that's on the left, uh, Spanish church on the left, on route, off of Route 18 in the North End area, just before it ends. That big white church, my father was roofing that church and he fell off. He broke his ankle. Years and years ago. Another time he was doing something and uh, he was tiring, a, uh, tiring a, a roof and he tripped over something and he fell right into the hot tar. And all of a sudden my mother's washing dishes looking. She was living in the, we were living in the project. She's looking out the window and here comes my father all wrapped up in bandages like this. But I want to tell you something though. He didn't stay out of work long. He was right back at work as soon as he could. And he was out there providing it for his family. How much more will God provide for you? How much more of someone who loves you eternally will provide for you? In Psalm 81 verse 10, he says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Egypt is a type of sin in typology. He said he brought us up out of the land of sin. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away and all things become new. And as our heavenly father, he says this, open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. God will always provide for you, and he'll always provide for me. In Psalm 84, verse 11, he said this, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. And look at this. No good thing does he withhold from those who what? Walk uprightly. If you walk uprightly, if you do what's right, if you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, then all these other things will be added. So many of us want to change divine order. We don't want to seek God first. We don't want to seek the righteousness. We want all the benefits. That's kind of like millennial thinking today. But God says, if you follow my divine order, if you seek God first and his kingdom and his righteousness then all these things that you have need of he will provide for you I can testify to you today from personal experience how many could do that how many could personally testify today of the goodness of God and how he has provided for you all of these years all of these years hallelujah when you were going through the rough rough times when it was very little and yet God somehow supplied it. I remember a time, Linda and I, we had nothing in our refrigerator. Nothing, nothing in the freezer. And Linda was driving to work one, one morning. Uh, she was crying out. Uh, we don't have any, I don't have anything to feed my husband. And we just, I just trusted God, you know, because I had, I had given away our food to someone who was in more need than us. That's the kind of person I am. And I used to give money that way till Linda took over the books. 
And then when she found out how everything was run, she says, I can't do this, and gave him back to me. She says, I don't know how we make it, on what, how you do it, but we do it. But God always did it. Amen? He always supplied. And I remember that afternoon, a knock on my door. And I opened my door, and there was a man standing there with two bags full of groceries. And said, I just felt to give you this. He wasn't even a Christian. He was a sinner. Not even a Christian man. But came and knocked at the door and said, I just felt to give you this. And inside there, there was pork chops, there was hamburg, there was chicken, there was steak, there was potatoes, there were onions. I'm telling you, you cannot outgive God. Hallelujah. So number one, he will take care of you. He will provide for you. For his name even is Jehovah Jireh. Our brother pre, uh, shared that this morning when we took the offering. He's our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He provides for us. Hallelujah. He provides so many things for us. And at times, we don't really understand or know those things that he does provide for us. Number two, he will protect us. He will protect us. How many of us have been in situations that if it wasn't for God's protection, we wouldn't be here? Driving our automobile somewhere. And that person just cut in front of you and, and you just saw it at the last moment. I tell my wife, don't do that when I'm following you. <laughs> How many times I could tell you of close encounters of Real severe accidents that God delivered me from. I remember one time I was at work. I was doing shipping and receiving. And it was almost time to get ready to close, you know, sh close up the shop. And uh, it, was, it was summer, and I was leaning like this on, near the garage door. And I didn't know that my finger was in the track. And she said, close the door so we can get out of here. And I pushed the button. And all of a sudden as that thing was coming down, could have rolled right over my finger and cut my finger off. How many know that God knew I was playing for him? And all of a sudden, I felt someone grab my elbow and go, just like that. I felt that. And I turned around to see if there was anybody there that pulled my hand. And then the, I saw the garage door come down. I said, Lord, you sent an angel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to pull my arm away. How many times God has protected us? In Deuteronomy 20, verse 4, it says, For the Lord your God is he who goes with you. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you. He's not only in you, but he'll go with you to fight for you. Come on, somebody. Against your enemies to save you. So not only will God provide for you, he will also protect you. Now, I've traveled in different countries in the world. And one of them was China. Now, when you fly into Hong Kong or you fly into one of the major cities like that, you have no problem. But when you go into inland China and you try to bring the gospel, if you're caught just with the Bible, you know, how many got your Bibles with you? You got your Bibles with you? If you're caught with the Bible, it's an automatic two-year sentence. Are you hearing me? All you have to do is just carry it with you. It's a two-year sentence if you have your Bible in inland China. There have been pastors that have been killed at the border for trying to smuggle in Bibles. Think about that. The Bible says, For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies. 
We'd say, well, Pastor, how come he didn't fight in China? Because they were marked to be martyrs for the cause of Christ. We don't know why Paul the Apostle had to have his head cut off. James thrust through with a sword. Peter crucified upside down. But I know this, one time when I was coming back from India and I had been so sick, and I said, Lord, why am I, why am I going through this? I, I was so sick. They brought me in the plane on a wheelchair. I said, why am I so sick, Lord? And he spoke these words to me. He said, all for the sake of the gospel. And I never forgot that, and I never complained after that. I said, God, it is an honor to suffer for you. If you could suffer for me, then this is nothing. He'll save you. Psalm 57, verse 3. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. He would swallow. He, he says, and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. In other words, those that are after you, you don't have to say a word. You don't have to say a word. Can I give you, I probably gave you this testimony a long time ago, but many of you were with us in the other building down a few, block, a few uh, um, places down here. We were on the left-hand side here. And that Sunday, one Sunday morning, I was preaching, and all of a sudden, yeah, well, I have to back up because I remember, sister, you brought somebody to church, a sister. And uh, she came a couple of times, and, then I, and I couldn't recognize her. And then I asked Angel, I said, who is that? And she told me, I said, oh, I know who she is now. And um, I was preaching, and all of a sudden, well, back up, let me back up. Her son was the high priest, Satanist high priest in Salem, Massachusetts. He was the head coven witch in Salem, her son. And that Sunday morning, I was preaching, and I felt a, a tingling down my arm. I felt pressure on my chest, and I, I felt weird. And I said, what's going on? And the voice spoke out in my mind, said, you're having a heart attack. And I stopped the service. Many of you might, might remember that. I stopped the service. I said, please pray. And this is how I prayed. I said, Lord Jesus, I, I believe you revealed to me that there is a witch that has put a curse on me to have a heart attack and to die. Lord Jesus, in your divine wisdom and knowledge, if you know that person will never repent of their sins and give their life to you, I pray in the name of Jesus that the very thing that they want from me happen to them. As soon as I finished that prayer, I could feel the release. The pain had left. My arm was back to normal, and I went back to preaching. Two weeks later, I looked it up too, by the way. Two weeks later, on a Sunday morning, that high Satanist priest, which his name was Azrin Hollow, died of a heart attack. He was 41 years old. He will save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. I want you to understand that I don't care where you're from. I don't care if you're from a country that practices voodoo, witchcraft, whatever it is. I want you to know, yes, it's powerful. But I want to let you know that the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost is greater than any witchcraft, greater than any devil. Hallelujah. Because Jesus on that cross, he defeated Satan when he said it is finished. The Bible says that Satan will not have dominion over you. He says he's given you power over scorpions, serpents, and over all the power of the enemy. You don't need to fear anything that the enemy has. I 
I remember looking in the face of a young man. He was in his, well, he was a young man. He was in his 40s, late 30s. And I was just a new Christian. And I was at a home prayer meeting. And all of a sudden, he fell on the ground. He started withering like a snake. And somebody tapped me and said, go pray. Well, all I know is that this book is my shield. So I took it. And I got on my knees. And I put my hand on his chest. And he looked at me with a growling snare. And he said, let me up. I'm just my little hand. He couldn't get up. He tried, he tried, tried. He couldn't get up. Now, I'm not the strongest person in the world. I know it wasn't me holding him there. It was the Holy Ghost. And he turned to me and he looked at me and he said, You can't have him. I've been in him since he's been a child. And this is what I said. I said, I don't want him. But Jesus does. I prayed for him, we prayed for him, and he, he got de delivered that night, partially, because I seen he still wasn't delivered, and I said it to the leaders, he's not delivered fully. They said, oh, no, you don't know, you're just a young Christian, you know. Well, guess what? He wasn't delivered. He ended up dying of, an over uh, of a complications later on, a year or two later. We have power. God said he will not let the reproach of him that would swallow us up. And that night I went home. I laid in my bed. And I, it was summertime. You know, I had the windows open. And all of a sudden I heard this growl <sighs> outside my window. Never heard it before. I said, my God. I grabbed my Bible. I was like this. I was in bed. I was shaking. I said, Lord Jesus, cover me with your blood tonight, Lord. I kept that Bible. I slept with that Bible right on my chest. I fell asleep. And then I had gone to church that Sunday, and there was a couple there that were used in deliverance ministry. And I, I asked them, I said, can I ask you a question? I told them what happened. They said, oh, boy, you better get ready because God's calling you to a deliverance ministry. He said, when that happens, it means the devils are upset. Because they know that you have something in God. Oh, Let me tell you something. You got power with the Heavenly Father. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you into the world. There's nothing to be afraid of. See, fear. Fear is the weapon the enemy uses. I mean, we had prayer Monday night. And the Monday before that, we had prayer. We're not praying for things. We're not praying for material things. We're not praying for blessings. We're not praying for any of that stuff. We're just seeking him. And I'm telling you, he is showing up. Come on, somebody. Okay? We're just seeking him for him. And, and just... God, Lord, cleanse us. Take out any sin in our life, any disobedience, Lord, any thoughts of, of rebellion, Lord. Take it all out of our hearts. Lord, we just want you. We don't want anything else. We just want you. And he's been showing up. I believe that's the beginning of a revival. Hallelujah. So number one, he'll provide. Number two, he'll protect. And number three, he promises and never, ever breaks a promise. Now, we've had fathers maybe made us promises, and then we couldn't come through with those promises. That can have a real dynamic effect on someone. But can I tell you, whatever God promises you, he'll never, never, ever break a promise. Let's see some of the ones he said. Number one, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And in the Greek, that means it's what's called a triple negative. He says, I will never, never, never leave you or forsake you. 
That's why if you look at the look at those triple and double, you know, and even in the positive, that's when he says, "Truly, truly, I say unto you." It emphasizes what is being said. So understand this: that he says, "I will never leave you nor forsake you, no matter what you go through in life, no matter what you have to face." And I can, I'm going to tell you, sometimes the greatest battles we have is with self. Sometimes the devil's just on the sideline. The battle we have a lot of times is with self. What we have been programmed all of these years before we were Christians. Things that have happened in our lives. Things that we've gone through in our lives before Christ. And then we get saved. And let me tell you, it's not all heaven. Because then we see some flaws. We see some things that come up. And God says, okay, now I want this. Give me this. And Oh, no, Lord, I've had this a long time. That's my security blanket. I've got to have that. You know, I've got to be able to keep things in control. God says, no, you are not to keep control. It's for me to have control. Come on, somebody. Sometimes the greatest battles we face is self. I want you to do this. No, I don't want to do that. I want you to do this. No, I don't want to do that. Well, guess what? He will withdraw his hand from you, and you won't get what you've been praying for. I told you, he doesn't have spoiled brats. You know, one of the things that really gets me upset, please pray for me. You know, past, they, sometimes people think pastors are perfect, and we're not. One of the things that gets me really upset is when I see a kid in, in a shopping place somewhere, and he wants something, the mother says no, and he, gets, he starts screaming at the top of his lungs. Jumping on the floor, flopping around on the floor. You know what I like to do? I like to go, hey, what a performance that is. All right, kid, yeah. Say to the mother, why do you let him do that? And then I look in the basket, and he's got what he wants. God has no spoiled children. Don't think for one moment you're going to rebel against God and God is obligated to give you anything. He's not. In fact, he won't give it to you because he's a good, good father. I remember my dad, and you, Joe, you remember this. All he had to do was look over the rim of his glasses. He put them glasses down like this. He looked at me. I knew what that meant. I remember I was cutting up or doing something, and your father looked at me one time and said, you want trouble? <laughs> I said, no, Mr. Fabio. <laughs> I was 16. <laughs> I said, no, Mr. Fabio, I don't want no trouble. Because <laughs> I know it was coming down a, down a <laughs> oh, yeah, uh-uh. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will love you with an everlasting love. Just because God loves us with an everlasting love doesn't mean that he just lets us go our own way. He says, I will meet your needs according to my riches and glory. And the most important one, which I love, we've been experiencing, I will manifest myself to you. I'll manifest myself to you. I will come and you will sense my presence and you will feel my presence in the time of trouble. See, some of you, you haven't even experienced life yet. But you go to some of these countries and you see they have absolutely nothing. I can't wait to go to those villages in India in September. These villages are off the charts. Nobody goes there. No preacher goes there. You know why? Because there's no money. And God is going to give me the opportunity to go. Sajiv, God bless you. I can't wait. But I'm not going there just empty-handed. That's why I need your support. I'm going to buy rice and chicken, and I'm going to give them a meal. Talk to them about Jesus. 
reach out to them? Because they have nothing. Do you remember the mission trip we went on? I read your testimony when you saw, it was like three years ago or four years ago, how she, when she first got there and she saw the dump. Listen to me. How many know what a dump is? How many have ever been to the dump? These people lived in the dump in Guatemala. They lived in the dump. They had little metal sheds that they lived in, and they would go through the garbage to find their meals. They're still going there and doing that today. And I remember Jen crying and weeping over that. And we were coming back on the plane, and she was sitting next to me, and she's just crying. And she said, I'm going home, and I'm selling everything I have. I said, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Had to kind of debrief her a little bit. God doesn't want you to do that unless he tells you to. But that's the reaction. You have such a compassion and love for people like that. Well, how much more God? Who knows what you have need of? So I'll come manifest myself to you. I will comfort you when you're hurting. When you call upon God as your father, Abba Father, and tell him you're hurting. That's why I don't understand none of these positive confessors on television. I don't understand. Don't confess that. Don't say that. Don't say you're hurting. Don't say you're, you're healing. You're healed. But if I'm asking God to heal me, <laughs> I got to ask. He says, you have not because you ask not. So if I'm, if I'm already healed, then I don't need to ask him. Don't confess that. Yes. If any of you sick among you, the Bible says, let them call for the elders of the church. Don't listen to these preachers. I'm telling you, they're not preaching the right gospel. God wants honesty. If you're hurting, tell him you're hurting. If you're lonely, tell him you're lonely. Whatever you're going through, just tell him so that he'll, he'll, say, he'll come to you and say, you know what? I'll comfort you with the comfort of the Holy Ghost. He is the comforter, by the way. Don't tell me he can't comfort you. Oh, yes. When my mother died, she wanted me to do the funeral. I was very close to mom. Think about that. If you had to do your mom's funeral. And a few years later, I had to do my brother's funeral. And then a year later, do my father's funeral. That's a heavy load. But God gave me comfort by his Holy Spirit. He gave me the grace to go through that. We all have pain. We all go through difficulties. But God's grace is sufficient for us. He says, I will strengthen you when you're weak. I will strengthen you when you're weak. You can be assured that God doesn't lie, but your feelings do. Your feelings do lie. I feel like God's forsaken me. What does God's word said? I told you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So who's right, your feelings or God's word? Come on, let me hear it. God's word is the one that's right. You know, feelings are nothing more than feelings. There was a song like that in the world, you know. Now Pastor Tom is like shaking his head, no, no, it's, it's going in my mind. The song is rotating in my mind. Is it in yours? Hmm? 
Don't go by feelings. Faith has nothing to do with feelings. I'll be moved by faith if I feel it. No, it don't work that way. No, that's not faith. Faith is going and walking and doing when you see absolutely nothing. You want me to what, Lord? You have to go by faith. Not by your feelings. God, I don't feel you today. Lying feelings. He's in you. And if you have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, he's upon you. So not only is he upon you and in you, but he's with you wherever you go. You're never alone. You'll never walk alone. It's only when you let your emotions and feelings take over and your mind begins to race and you're beginning away from this word. Thy word will keep, his word will keep you in perfect peace as your mind is stayed upon him. Do I have it all figured out? No, but one thing I do have figured out, I know who my God is. And nobody can change that. If I was to be beaten with rods in the streets, and people kicking me saying, where is your God? I'd be saying, he's with me. He's with me. Because my circumstances doesn't determine truth. Truth is truth. In fact, remember when Stephen was being stoned? What did Jesus do? He stood up. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Well, when Stephen was getting stoned and he was about ready to take his last breath, the Bible says that Jesus stood up to receive him. Wow. Why? Because he was fulfilling a promise when he told his disciples that where I am, there may you be also. People ask, are you really sure you're going to heaven? Can you really know that you're going to heaven? I say, yep. I'm going to heaven. Because the Bible says that you may know, these things were written that you may know that you have eternal life. You may know it. I know it. As long as I stay in Christ, as long as he is my Lord and Master, as long as I endure to the end, the same shall be saved. I'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so nothing in this world can separate us from the love of God. He is our Father, which art in heaven. Amen? Praise God. I want to sing this song. Pastor's going to play the song. I want us to close with the song. If you feel to come to the altar, just come. Remember, remember what I told you. Let me before he does that. Though, let me say this: We've been making. We were bring. We are bringing back the altar into a, into church. We're bringing the place of meeting God back to the church. This service starts with people at the altar, and I believe it should end with people at the altar. Amen. So I want those of you who are willing. If you're not willing, don't come. But if you're willing, come up to the altar and just kneel down here. And we'll go, or, or stand here. Just stand here. That's fine. We're going to sing this song. Amen? Come on.